Well, I want to say good morning to everyone. So happy to see so many people here this morning. I am Irit Vinitsky. I am the Enrichment Program Facilitator at the Minnesota JCC. And just want to welcome everyone to TC Talks, Demystifying Cancer Immunotherapy for Lay Audiences. If you have questions during the talk, please write them in the chat and our guests will answer them at the end of the hour. Um, and I am um, pleased to introduce our speakers today. They, are, they all come from the University of Minnesota Medical School. Um, our first speaker is um, William Hoffman, Communications Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at the University of Minnesota. So you can go ahead. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Eric. Uh, I'm joined by uh, my colleagues, uh, Christopher Pinnell uh, in my, uh, from my department, uh, an immunologist, and Kiara Ellis, who's Director of Community Outreach and uh, Engagement at the Masonic Cancer Center at the university, where, where Chris is Associate Director for Education. And incidentally, this talk, Demystifying uh, Cancer Immunotherapy, is a talk they give and have given to numerous uh, community organizations uh, over the recent years. Now, this Zoom event is about cancer, but it's also really about science communication. Uh, never has good science communication been uh, more important than it is today. Uh, public trust in science has been challenged during the pandemic as never before. I don't have to go into that detail on that. And certain ethnic communities are more mistrustful of science than others based on, in part on their historical experience. And that's reflected in the current vaccination comparison. Now a quote, the best arguments in the world won't change a single mind. The only thing that can do that is a good story, unquote. That's Ken Burns talking to former WCCO news anchor Don Shelby on a TPT program the other night, which uh, TPT uses uh, reruns uh, during its fundraising, uh, uh, um, during its fundraising uh, period. Cancer is the leading, second leading cause of death uh, uh, in the US. It affects most families, either directly or indirectly. And I'd like to recommend a book uh, that uh, really tells the, the story of cancer better than any other resource, uh, both from a historical and from human interest uh, perspective. And that is Sid Siddhartha Mukherjee's book, The Emperor of All Maladies, a biography of cancer that was published in 2010. <clears throat> Uh, and that, and in that book, uh, he cover, as I say, he covers the, the research front. But in, tw in 2010, something began to happen uh, that actually has the, sort of taken the field of clinical cancer therapy by storm, and that is the immuno, the new cancer immunotherapies. Now, cancer immunotherapies go back five decades or more, but it's what happened in the last couple of decades that we're going to talk about today. And these cancer immunotherapies are a key component of the National Cancer Institute's Moonshot Initiative uh, launched in 2016. And now I will see if I can bring up my slides here. All right. Um, the revolution in cancer therapy is, is many fold, but two principal technologies are key. One is called uh, uh, can, uh, block, excuse me, immune uh, checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, you can see in the top panel there, a T cell, uh, and T cells are key here. Key T cells are, are uh, one of the two cellular components of the adaptive immune system, which goes back 500 million years in mammals, as I understand it. Uh, and they are very important T cells for fighting cancer. Uh, as you can see in the top uh, panel, however, as, as, as a switch indicates, tumor killing is off because what happens is the T cell uh, does attack the tumor cell, but then the tumor cell in a feedback fashion sends a molecule back to the T cell to essentially put the put on the brakes. And that's the PD-1 uh, PD in green there and the PD-L1 in red. And what's happened uh, in recent years is the, is the uh, um, use of monoclonal antibodies, which are biological drugs, to basically block the ability uh, of the tumor cell to, uh, to give that signal, feedback signal to the T cell to basically call off your killing. Uh, so by blocking that, that, uh, that process, T cells are much more uh, aggressive in killing tumor cells. I think, I think the number is eight 
immune checkpoint inhibitors have been uh, FDA approved up till now. The second process is not a drug process, but rather a uh, cellular uh, uh, engineering and, and, and cellular therapy process. It's called CAR-T, and I'll have Dr. Pinnell go into the details on that. Uh, basically, as you see, it, it's going left to right around the circle. Uh, blood is removed from a patient. T cells are engineered uh, with to, and outfitted with a specific targeting a molecule that allows us very specific targeting of the tumor cells, re then reinfused into the patient. Uh, and we have, I think, five FDA approved uh, cellular therapies, CAR T cellular therapies, uh, since it, the initial approval in um, 2017. The art of dying. Peter Sheldahl. Who is Peter Sheldahl? Peter Sheldahl is a celebrated New Yorker magazine art critic, ranked in the top five uh, uh, as art critics go by, in some surveys. He is a war baby, a native of Fargo, and then on to Farmington and then Northfield, where he spent his boyhood. His mother was the daughter of a North Dakota superintendent. His father was a son of a North Dakota railroad worker who became a successful entrepreneur, entrepreneur and innovator in cutting and sealing thin plastics like mylar, which we used in NASA weather balloons and, and were also used in sickness bags on airliners. Today, Sheldahl is, describes itself as a flex company down in, in Northfield. He is a Carleton College dropout and later awarded a uh, honorary doctorate degree by Carleton for his, for his uh, accomplishments. He, was at, he, he aspired to be a poet uh, and so off to New York and then Paris and then ran out of money, of course, how that, you know, how that goes. And then back to New Jersey where he worked as a newspaper reporter and then found his way to art criticism, writing for the Village Voice and other publications in the 60s. He had achieved st such stature as an art critic that he was hired by the New Yorker in 1998 and he is still there. The Art of Dying, he published in uh, 20, December of 2019 it's a widely read, wry, self-effacing commentary on a personal matter. And I'm going to read uh, a couple paragraphs from the, uh, from the article itself. Beginning, lung cancer, rampant, no surprise. I've smoked since I was 16 behind the high school football bleachers in Northfield, Minnesota. I got the preliminary word from my doctor by phone while driving al alone upstate from the city to join my wife, Brooke, at our community place, after the call, I found myself overwhelmed by the beauty of the passing late August land. And again, so this is now two years ago. And he, uh, he basically tells much of his life story in, in brief in this, uh, in this article, as I say, which is very widely read. And then toward the end, I'm not in physical pain as, uh, pain as I write, though I tire quickly and nap often. I have been receiving every three weeks an immunotherapy infusion, not chemo, not a cure, which at the outset, the doctor said had a 35% chance of slowing the disease. A recent scan showed, shows marked improvement, likely extending my prospect for survival. But I have to wonder if whatever betides, I can stay upbeat in spirit. A thing about dying is that you can't consult anyone who has done it. No rehearsals, no mulligans. All right, so that's uh, that published in December. And that was the same month that uh, that um, uh, he took. He decided, given his circumstance, he wanted to see the the, the work of the masters in, in the Prado in Spain, which I was fortunate to see a, a couple, three years ago or so, including uh, La Meninas, Las, me, Las Meninas by the great uh, masterpiece by Diego Velazquez. Uh, and so he went back and he he uh, he relooked at this uh, 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 painting. And he said he had a completely different uh, understanding of it, a more melancholy understanding of it in light of the pandemic and, in, and presumably in light of his own personal circumstance. Uh, and so he, as, he, as, he, uh, as he indicates there, uh, there's no substitute, of course, for, for uh, uh, seeing paintings in person, virtual museums don't work in his estimation. And he's he's, uh, he's yearning for the return to the the, uh, the in in uh, in person visits to museums. Uh, I've I've discovered myself that Velasquez uh, painted this masterpiece while his hometown of Seville was was uh, uh, was being devastated by plague back in the 17th century. Now, uh, 
in the in a uh, the uh, April 2020 uh, uh, New Yorker, he writes uh, out of time mortality and the old masters in a brief uh, paragraph from there. And then I'll stop. Cancer is an archipelago of hospital med uh, medicine normalized across the land. I have cancer, but with fading awareness of it, as immunotherapy gives me an unexpected lease on life. And one last thing about uh, uh, Minnesota here, uh, we have a couple of one-two punches I'd like to mention. Uh, the, U of, U of Men, uh, the U of M and the Mayo Clinic uh, are very strong historically in immunology, the study of the immune system, and hematology, which is the study of blood, bone marrow, and the lymph system. Uh, and that gives us a, a, a solid, a solid uh, uh, um, a, a basis for progress in the cancer immunotherapies. Uh, and then also we have a, here at the university, a, uh, a, we've combined T-cell immunotherapies with genome editing. And you may have heard of gene editing. Uh, the, the, uh, Walter Isaacson, the author, has published a book, a best-selling book called The Cold, Cold Breaker about Berkeley, uh, uh, Berkeley's Jennifer Downer and her colleague who invented the CRISPR gene editing system. And here at the U of M, we have a clinical trial in which both immunotherapy and gene editing have been combined uh, uh, to attack metastatic GI cancer. And so we'll, it's in phase two right now, we'll have to wait and see how that pans out. But we are, I think in, this is an indication of the strength we have here in Minnesota. So with that, I will stop uh, and, uh, and turn it over to uh, Chris and Chiara. Well, thanks very much, Bill, for that introduction. And I'm going to um, expand on some of the points that you mentioned. Um, let me just pull up my slides. So can you all see this slide, demystifying cancer immunotherapy? Great, thanks very much. First, thanks very much for this uh, invitation to speak with you all. Kiara and I are excited about it. We, um, Kiara deals more with people. They, they don't let me near people too much. I just deal with mice. So this is a virtual, uh, I'm virtually happy about this dealing with you all. So I'm gonna start with a story. Uh, this is a picture of Emily Whitehead taken on her fifth birthday in May of 2010. Uh, she lives in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Two weeks after this picture was taken, Emily was diagnosed with pre-B cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia. That's a mouthful it's essentially blood cancer. Her parents were devastated by this diagnosis, but they got a small measure of comfort in the fact that for this type of childhood leukemia, there was a 90% cure rate, meaning that they were 90% sure that Emily would live to be an adult. If this had been in the 1960s and Emily received this diagnosis, it would have only been a 10% chance of long-term survival. So the, in the ensuing 50 years, uh, research pushed that 10% to 90%. So what her parents decided to do was to follow the standard course of treatment, which was chemotherapy, um, a, a few different doses of chemotherapy. So she underwent the appropriate treatment regimen as an, and as expected, her, her disease um, disappeared. So that was the good news. Uh, the bad news was that her remission lasted only about a year and a half. And in October of 2011, her leukemia returned with a vengeance and it was now resistant to the chemotherapy cocktail that originally put it into remission. So she had to undergo an even more aggressive uh, type of treatment to try to put her leukemia in remission before she was um, scheduled to receive a bone marrow transplant. Unfortunately, even after this more intensive chemotherapy regimen, her, her disease returned and uh, she was too sick for the transplant. So in February of 2012, she was just given weeks to live. And it was at this point that Emily's parents decided to enroll her as the first pediatric patient in a clinical trial conducted at the Children's Hospital in Philadelphia by Carl June. And this trial used those CAR T cells uh, that Bill alluded to pre previously. And as uh, this is just a, a variation on the picture that Bill showed, what this therapy involves was taking white blood cells from Emily, healthy white blood cells, isolating them, activating them, modifying them with the gene therapy, expanding, up, expanding them up to billions of numbers and then reinfusing them into Emily. And this picture was taken in May of this past year. 
She's 16 years old and she's in complete remission and is still going strong. She would have died otherwise. So this is just one of many success stories that immunotherapy has provided us. What I wanted to do was to put immunotherapy in historical context. And it's the um, not the end stage of evolution, but it's the most um, recent phase of the evolution of cancer therapy. So we know from historical records that ancient civilizations like the Egyptians and the Persians used surgery to treat tumors thousands of years ago. In the early 1900s, radiation therapy and chemotherapy were added to the, um, to the pillars of cancer therapy. And then at the beginning of this century, something called precision therapy and within the last decade, immunotherapy have been added to our armamentura of um, cancer therapeutics. And so what's happened over this time period is that the specificity of killing malignant cells has increased. And so as many of you probably know, what oftentimes will kill a patient or will cause them to have morbidity, which is a, um, a disease or poor quality of life, is the toxic side effects of chemotherapy and radiation therapy. And those toxic side effects result from the killing of healthy cells, not malignant cells. Um, and so what we're trying to do in cancer therapy is to increase specificity such that healthy cells are spared and only malignant cells are killed. And so specificity is really the holy grail of cancer therapy. If we can kill only malignant cells and spare healthy cells, we can give almost unlimited doses of whatever therapeutic regimen we have, um, and the patient will be able to tolerate that. So going back to the evolution of cancer, how do these things work? Well, conventional therapy, which is chemotherapy and radiation therapy, kill rapidly dividing cells, but they do not distinguish between malignant cells that are rapidly dividing and healthy cells that are rapidly dividing. And the way that they work is to um, basically break DNA to so many small pieces that the cell will commit suicide. So I like to think in, in numbers as well as pictures. And so each cell in our body has DNA that is seven feet long. So if you were to lay out the DNA in a given cell end to end, it would be seven feet long. And it's packaged in an organelle or structure that's about one five thousandth of an inch in diameter. So this is a heck of a packaging job. And the way that it's done is it's wrapped around protein balls, which are wrapped around themselves, which are wrapped around themselves until you get these things called chromosomes. So most of the DNA is tightly packed. For one cell to become two cells, which is what we call division or growth, this DNA has to be unraveled such that the copying enzymes, the copying mechanisms can access the DNA and copy all of these letters such that each of the daughter cells has an exact copy of the information that the parental cell had. And so if a cell is undergoing rapid division, more of this DNA is going to be exposed than a cell that is, is quiescent, not dividing. And so if you treat a cell with chemotherapy or radiation therapy, the DNA that's rapidly packaged is not going to be really affected. It's the DNA that's exposed that's affected. And so this DNA is broken up. But again, the problem is that healthy cells and malignant cells use the same mechanisms to copy their DNA and to unwind their DNA and to expose their DNA. So rapidly dividing cells like your hair follicle cells within your intestinal system are constantly being turned over and they're the ones that are also killed by chemotherapy and radiation therapy. So we wanted to get better. And as we learn more about tumor cells, we started to understand what made them unique and what caused them to differ from healthy cells. And so we were able to develop, when I say we, it's not me, it's the whole field. Um, we were able to develop more tumor specific killing reagents. And so an example of this, is found in metastatic colorectal cancer. And this cartoon is just a cell. This red line on the outside represents the membrane, which keeps the outside of the cell out and the inside of the cell inside. 
This is the um, organelle that contains all of the genetic information, the DNA, it's called the nucleus. And this is a factory, which is, uh, it's part of another type of cell, intracellular organelle that makes proteins, which are the workhorses of the cell. So this information is translated into proteins, which actually do the work. And of course, there we go, whoops. So about 30% or so of metastatic colorectal cancers overexpress a receptor called EGFR. And these satellite dishes represent these receptors. These receptors are expressed hundreds to thousands of fold more frequently on these malignant cells than they are on the healthy cells. And so this EGF stands for epidermal growth factor and R is the receptor. So if you've got thousands of more receptors on the surface of this cell for this factor that causes it to grow, these cells are gonna be able to respond to very small amounts of this growth factors, amounts that would be too small for a healthy cell to respond to. And so it delivers all of these signals to the cell that causes the cell to grow because this receptor is overexpressed. Well, upon finding that, we've developed a drug called Herbitux, which can block these <clears throat> receptors. And what, causes, what happens then is that these growth signals are no longer received because they're blocked at the cell surface and the cell will ultimately um, kill itself. And so this Herbitux is useful for cancers that overexpress this type of epidermal growth factor receptor. So now we're starting to get into more specificity. But what's really revolutionized the field is work in the last 10 or 20 years, which is now allowing us to develop patient-specific therapies or precision medicine type of therapies. And there are two types of precision medicines. One is called pharmacogenomics. And this combines pharmacology, the study of drugs, with genetics or genomics. And these are treatments that are tailored to the genetic changes, both in the person's cancer and to the person's own genetics. And so an example of that is just um, in a cartoon form here. So I have four individuals that are genetically unrelated and they all have the same type of disease. Let's say um, acute lymphoblastic leukemia for the sake of argument. Well, let's say we have four different drugs to treat this disease. How do you know which drug to give which patient? Well, by studying the person's own genetics, we can um, have an understanding as to how they will tolerate or how they will treat these drugs. One may break down the drug really quickly. So then you might wanna give that person higher doses or more frequent doses. Another person may not break down that drug at all and it may be toxic. So you don't wanna give that drug or give it in very low doses. And so by combining, combining our knowledge of the genetics of the tumor to pick a drug and the genetics of the person to pick one of several versions of the drug, we can match the drug to the person's own biochemistry and their own tumor. We can do this with only a few uh, cancers right now, but this field is exploding in terms of, um, because we're understanding more about what the enemy is, what the cancer is and how it works and how our own bodies can take these drugs. So pharmacogenomics is a burgeoning area of cancer therapy. The other type of therapy is immunotherapy. And of course, I think this is the best one because I'm a tumor immunologist and I've been studying this for 30 years. Um, the first 20 years we were banging our head, heads against the wall, but in the last 10 years, it's been really exciting. And so what is immunotherapy and why is it useful? Well, it uses the immune system to treat a disease. Okay, so what is the immune system? We'll get into that in a minute. But immunotherapy has been a game changer for cancer because it's exquisitely specific. The immune system has evolved to be exquisitely specific. It can distinguish a protein made from a bacteria from a protein that's made by our own bodies. So it can determine what's, what's a stranger molecule, something that's not made by us. It could also recognize dangerous molecules that we make ourselves because of mutations. So those mutations are, are differences that arise in cancers and the immune system can recognize those as being not, not us, not self, not, and something that we should eradicate. So it's this specificity that has really excited immunologists about cancer. The other thing is it's incredibly potent. 
and I'll show you a, a video of this in a couple of minutes, but one tumor specific white blood cell can kill thousands of tumor cells. It's long lived. Emily received one dose of chemotherapy when she was um, 11 years old. Uh, no, 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 when she was seven years old, I'm sorry. One dose and she's still fine because the, this drug is, uh, is long lived. And so the types of, car, uh, types of immunotherapy, car T cell therapy that Bill alluded to, and I'll talk about are called living drugs because they persist in the body. And then critically, the immune system is adaptable. So tumors mutate as they grow. And so it's like trying to hit a moving target and the immune system can, can play catch up if you will, and can adapt to these changes that occur in cancer cells. So specificity, potency, long lived uh, memory and adaptability are the four features of the immune system that make it um, almost ideally suited to treat cancer. So to get an appreciation as to how immunotherapy works, we need to go over a little bit of the immune system. So a little bit of immunology 101. The major function of the immune system is to maintain balance or equilibrium or what we call homeostasis in the body. And when this homeostasis is uh, perturbed by injury, infection or disease, the immune system becomes activated. And the end result in a healthy individual is a return to homeostasis back to your healthy state. So the wound is healed, the infection is resolved, or the disease is eradicated. And one of the natural functions of the immune system is called immune surveillance. And the immune system is constantly removing malignant cells that are arising in our body throughout our lifetime. And so this is a very uh, detailed cartoon of how this occurs. And so the immune system is constantly recognizing mutated proteins and removing cells that express those mutated proteins. And this occurs daily in our bodies. And to give you an appreciation, again, getting back to numbers, the average human adult has about 10 trillion cells in his or her body. We make any, the estimates are between 200 to 400 billion new cells every day. And if you then go ahead and look at the numbers, the numbers of the individual components of DNA, there are subunits of DNA, they all have to be copied in every one of those cells that's being uh, newly formed. And so those numbers of molecules that are copied every day in our body are on the orders of trillions of billions. So when you're dealing with numbers that large, mistakes are gonna happen. And the immune system is almost like the last barrier to preventing tumors from arising. And so by definition then, tumors that are clinically apparent have escaped immune recognition. And they have figuratively erected a wall or a barrier that prevents the immune system from eliminating them. And so the tumor can grow and become clinically apparent. And so immunologists for over a century have recognized the potential of using the immune system to treat cancer, but it was this barrier that prevented us from using immunotherapy because we didn't understand how the wall was built. But work done in the last 20 years has have, um, by a number of people has elucidated what the bricks are in the wall and what the mortar is that's holding those bricks together. And with that information, now we can overcome this barrier and use the immune system, those four characteristics to treat cancer. So continuing on our theme of immunology 101, like most biological systems, the immune system is not black and white, it's a continuum. And one arm is called innate immunity, the other arm is adaptive immunity, but there are a lot of steps in between them. And we're gonna focus on the right end of the immune system, which is the adaptive immune system, which comprises two types of, B, uh, two types of white blood cells called B cells and T cells. And simply B cells attack invaders outside the body, outside the cells, like bacteria and viruses, where T cells can affect um, or attack infected cells as well as cancer cells. And we've used both of these types of cells to treat cancer. So let's focus initially on B cells. B cells make molecules called antibodies. And Bill mentioned monoclonal antibodies. I'll describe what those are in a minute. But these molecules, can be secreted by the B cells. And so they're floating around in the bloodstream. Um, and that's why Bill referred to them as biological drugs. 
They can be, um, they're soluble molecules that can go pretty much anywhere in the body. And in order to define how they work, I need to again, just dig a little bit deeper into immunology 101. And there are generally two flavors of antibodies called polyclonal and monoclonal. Poly means many and clone means derived from a single progenitor. And when immunologists were first identifying antibodies back in the 40s and the 50s, everybody and his brother and sister were, were immunizing guinea pigs, rats, rabbits, with molecules to see if they can make antibodies against them. And so the word antigen uh, derived from anything that generates an antibody. And so if you stick an antigen into a guinea pig, and then you can repeatedly immunize the, the guinea pig or the rabbit or the rat or whatever with an antigen, and then collect the blood, and in the fluid phase of the blood will be these soluble molecules called antibodies. And they were made by B cells against whatever you immunize the animal with. And so if the antigen has got different um, binding sites on it, if you will, or different structures, you can make antibodies against a variety of different cell surface features of the antigen. So you've got five different antibodies binding five different parts of the antigen. And they're binding only this antigen. So here's where the specificity comes in. Antibody one will not bind anything else. It will only bind these structures on this antigen. And so this was great. We could make these polyclonal antibodies and we started to make them against tumor cells. But the problem is that every time you immunize a person, you're gonna get a different batch of these antibodies. So instead of one, two, three, four, five, the next time you may get six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, the next time you may get a lot of one and a little bit of two. And so this, this heterogeneity was not conducive for doing experiments because you're, it was varying every time. So one lot of antibody would behave the same, but it would vary from rabbit to rabbit and even within a rabbit over multiple immunizations. So it was this variability that um, was not allowing us to really understand what was going on. And so about 30 years ago, two investigators developed a technique that allowed us to make what are called monoclonal antibodies. So mono means one. We can make antibodies only from one B cell. And now what we have is a chemically defined biological reagent that is made in, in unlimited quantities. And it's the same as if Bill made it in his lab and I made it in my lab. So it was this homogeneity that allowed us to actually make drugs. And this, um, I'm going to just share my screen. Can you all see this, how monoclonal? Okay, great, thanks. Antibodies treat cancer. Antibodies are molecules that our bodies make to help fight germs. Monoclonal antibodies are similar molecules that are made in laboratories and are used by doctors to find or treat cancer and other diseases. This video explains what monoclonal antibodies are and a few ways they're used to treat cancer. Antibodies are Y-shaped molecules that attach tightly to a target. They're very specific, meaning that each antibody attaches to only one target. An antibody and its target fit together like pieces of a puzzle. In the laboratory, scientists can make many identical copies of a monoclonal antibody that can attach to a specific target, such as a molecule on the surface of cancer cells. These monoclonal antibodies can block molecules cancer cells need to grow, flag cancer cells for destruction by the body's immune system, or deliver harmful substances to cancer cells. This makes them a valuable type of targeted therapy for treating cancer. For example, a monoclonal antibody called trastuzumab attaches to a molecule called HER2 on the surface of some cancer cells. Blocking HER2 keeps it from sending signals the cancer cells need to grow. Another example involves VEGF, which is a molecule that makes blood vessels grow. A monoclonal antibody called bevacizumab blocks VEGF. Blocking VEGF stops the growth of new blood vessels that the tumor needs to survive. 
A third example is the monoclonal antibody pembrolizumab. Pembrolizumab attaches to molecules called immune checkpoints on immune cells. Blocking immune checkpoints helps the immune cells kill cancer cells. Other monoclonal antibodies treat cancer by flagging cancer cells for destruction. For example, when the monoclonal antibody rituximab attaches to a molecule called CD20 on cancer cells, it acts like a flag for immune cells. The immune system sees this flag and destroys the cancer cells. Some monoclonal antibodies fight cancer by delivering drugs, toxins, or radioactive particles to cancer cells. For example, brentuximab vedotin is a monoclonal antibody that is linked to a chemotherapy drug. When the antibody attaches to its target on cancer cells, it delivers the chemotherapy drug, which kills them. Cancer researchers are continuing to investigate new ways to use the precision of monoclonal antibodies to treat cancer patients. So the number of monoclonal antibodies that are FDA approved or approved in the European Union are going up every year, every year. And you can see that roughly half of them in 2020 were for cancer. And so our ability to identify targets and make antibodies to them is growing um, and it's going to be growing exponentially. So what we can do now that we understand how the wall is built is to overcome it in one of two strategies. One is to reduce the height of the wall or reduce the integrity of the wall such that the immune system can get through. And that pembrolizumab that they mentioned is also called Keytruda. You may have seen commercials on television for it. They'll call it Keytruda because pembrolizumab will break your jaw, <laughs> trying to say that. Um, and this is called an immune checkpoint blockade. And the tumor cells have evolved ways to shut off T cells and B cells. And what pembrolizumab does is it blocks that break that tumors can put onto the immune system. And the reason I have a picture of uh, Jimmy Carter up here is that President Carter was diagnosed with malignant melanoma, which is a type of skin cancer, about six or seven years ago. And he was treated with. Um, one of these checkpoint blockade monoclonal antibodies, and it put his melanoma into remission, and it's allowed him to continue to build houses for habitat for humanity at the age of 95. He would have died otherwise. So now let's look at the other type of adaptive immune cell called the T cell. And these cells can see what's going on within an infected cell or within a cancer cell. And the advantage of this approach is that a T cell can kill a virally infected cell before the virus has the chance to release thousands of viral particles as they're developing in the cell. So a T cell can see an infected cell and kill it before the virus can be released. And similarly, it can kill cancer cells. And so this is a, um, a video just showing how these cytotoxic or killer T cells can work. These are immune cells called cytotoxic T cells. Cytotoxic T cells are able to recognize and kill virally infected and cancerous cells in the body. These T cells are on patrol, searching for their targets. Let's take a closer look at how they move. Cytotoxic T cells are constantly migrating around your body. They move through your tissues by pushing out the membrane at the leading edge of the cell and pulling themselves forward. When a T cell encounters a cancer cell, an explosion of membrane protrusions explore the surface of the target. Cytotoxic T cells kill their targets with toxic chemicals. The chemicals are housed in these red structures called lytic granules. You can see the lytic granules polarized from the rear of the T cell to the blue cancer cell. These toxic granules secrete specifically toward the target protecting innocent bystanders which may be nearby. As the membrane of the target is compromised by the toxins in the granules, our indicator flashes bright red, signaling the impending death of the cancerous cell. 
Movies like these allow us to study the efficiency with which cytotoxic T cells operate. Now we'll leave you with a few more movies of T cells doing what they do best, killing cancer. Okay, so each of those killer green cells can kill thousands of tumor cells. And they only stop killing when they can no longer find a tumor cell to kill. And at that point, they, they do one of two things. They either commit suicide or essentially they go to sleep and become a long-lived memory cell such that if the tumor ever recurs or they, if they ever find it again, they can kill it almost immediately. And those were real cells. They weren't, uh, they weren't animations. I mean, these, that's how it really works. And so one of the key things we have to figure out is how do you get these cells to turn on? How do you get them activated? And like a B cell, T cells recognize particular antigens. So the T cells are exquisitely specific like a B cell in the antibody. But the problem or the difficulty that we have is that the type of antigen, the type of structure that a T cell sees is much more restricted than an antibody. So we're very limited in what we can get a T cell to, to recognize and kill. So in order for a T cell, a naive T cell, a baby B T cell, if you will, to become activated and become a killer cell, it needs to get three signals. One is by recognizing a specific antigen. The second comes from what we call a co-stimulatory molecule, and there are many of these. And then the third is a soluble molecule, like a growth factor, similar to what we saw before, like VEGF or EGF or something like that. So it needs these three signals to become fully activated and to become a killer. And so with this knowledge, what we've been able to do is we've been able to genetically engineer T cells to recognize whatever we want them to recognize and bypass what they were born to recognize. And the way that we do this is by making what's called a chimeric antigen receptor or CAR. Chimeric is derived from the Greek mythological beast that uh, was a component of three different animals. It was the head of a lion, the body of a goat, and the tail of a serpent. So a chimeric antigen receptor has a portion of an antibody, that portion of the antibody that binds tightly to an antigen. Don't worry, this is, this is just the nomenclature for that. So what we've done now is we've taken the part of the T cell receptor that would bind antigen and only a, a very limited number of antigens. And now we've put on it an antigen binding portion from a, an antibody that we've selected against whatever we want it to bind. And then what we do is we take that antibody portion and then we link it to signaling components that provide signals one and signals two that a T cell needs to become activated. And the third signal from that soluble cytokine, we just add to the um, media in which these cells are growing. So now when the outside, the antibody fragment binds its antigen on a tumor cell, it delivers both signals one and signal two, where normally these would be encoded by separate molecules. And then we've got the third signal so we can activate this T cell. And this overrides whatever the T cells native receptor would recognize. And so with that um, knowledge then, this is, this is how we can use CAR T cells to treat cancer. So these different colors represent different specificities, different antigens that T cells can recognize. So we can take my T cells out of my blood, genetically engineer them to recognize the same thing which I've colored in black. And then this acts like a tsunami that overpowers whatever suppression the tumor cells had and it will eradicate the tumor. And this is the type of therapy that Emily had. And this is after she ran a 5K race on her 16th birthday a couple of months ago. So immunotherapy is phenomenally exciting. And we're moving to the day where we're not going to treat patients with chemotherapy anymore. We're going to identify molecules that we can attack and then hopefully tap into their own immune systems and use the, use the body's own immune system to, to treat cancer. And with that, I'm going to stop and then turn it over to my colleague, Kiara. And I have Kiara's slides. So Kiara, uh, when you want to advance, just let me know. Okay, feel free. Thank you. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm Kiara Ellis. I'm the Director of Community Outreach and Engagement. You can feel free to tap on our first slide. 
Um, I want to just circle in on what Chris um, discussed by sharing what we do as an office. So we are um, we are the um, Office of Community Outreach and Education for the Masonic Cancer Center. Our biggest goals are connecting with community. So one of the beautiful things about the Masonic Cancer Center is that not only are we concerned about re cancer research and clinical care for our patients, but a key part of our cancer center is actually reaching out into community. So what Chris Share really does help you frame how our um, faculty and researchers start to break down the complicated topic that is cancer for communities. Um, we, because we're embedded in the University of Minnesota, we see the people that we serve as the entire universe or the state of Minnesota. So we're always looking at ways that we can improve the way that um, we work with different communities across Minnesota that meet needs of diversity and that we're meeting their needs and concerns about cancer. So next slide. Um, building partnerships is one of the key things that we do in order to share the messages that you hear about cancer and start to really understand community. So I thought it would be a really good idea for you to kind of get a sense of what it is that we do. We have ongoing partnerships with the intentions of making an impact. So we're constantly developing um, different community partnerships such as this. Um, we are also always looking and I'm trying to understand the burden of cancer in our state so that not only do our community um, outreach folks are um, building connections with communities that make sense, but we're also helping inform our researchers with what the community is looking for and hoping to understand. Um, we provide culturally tailored education to our community members, which I'll talk about a little bit more. We also do lots of grant making with community partners um, where they're able to bubble up what's concerning them about cancer in their community to the university to have faculty focused, um, focus in on those topics. Um, and we're constantly working on creating lanes and opportunities for this bi-directional um, communication, ways that the community can inform what we do as a cancer center and how we're approaching things that are most concerning. So the way that our office works really truly is being part of the middle ground. You can go to the next slide. Um, I would say we're doing community engagements with community at large. We are in small um, community groups like like this, where we're doing more one-to-one -one education. We also do large events, like you see this picture of us at the state fair. We meet community where they're at, and that's one of the key functions of our community engagement team is making sure that we are meeting people where they're at. So connecting with community, big or small, we're hoping that we're addressing the concerns that you have and are able to start to help break down some of those topics um, that are more complicated, like immunotherapy. We'll go to the next slide. Um, so like I said, connecting and building those relationships and bring, breaking down the large topic that like immunotherapy. So what Chris does is, Chris is one of our, I will say unicorn faculty that does an, an excellent job of helping communities that are not familiar with research or cancer broadly really understand what he means. There's, I'm not a scientist at all. My background is in social work. I do a lot of community building. So we, my team usually asks the questions of our faculty to help them help break down topics so that the audiences and the communities that we serve really truly understand what it is um, that we're discussing, what cancer is, how it might be affecting them, what it's looking like in community. Um, and that's our role in the art of storytelling is helping break down the complicated topics and show um, community that we're here for them in a way that we're hoping and willing to continue to give them education and support um, support uh, their cancer journey wherever it might be, from prevention through survivorship. 
Um, storytelling and the way that you saw Chris really break down his presentation with visual aids, starting at kind of the immunotherapy 101 and going into how it is affecting people and building, putting personal connections in it is a way that we make a lot of our work really community centered. Um, and we, the way that we're able to be culturally inclusive. Many cultures, many communities use literal storytelling as the way that they pass down information. And so we see the opportunity for help passing health information in the same way by connecting personal um, stories, um, by sharing these visuals. Um, and we see cultures like the Hmong in Minnesota really telling stories through like their sewing cloths and things like that. We wanna make sure that we're showing up for community in a way that makes the most sense. Um, so our ways of being creative to sell to um, share that information is by doing some of the hands-on things that you see breaking down. Um, you see in these images where we create games or quizzes and ways that we can show you how um, the different structures of cancer can be less complicated and easy to consume. And kind of in the spirit of everything that is happening in COVID, which, which Bill actually wrapped up really well, it's more important now than ever to really understand how science works in the phase of something like the crisis that is COVID um, and talking about the vaccine and the way the immune system works. It's more important than ever. Um, so this is something that our team is really excited about, really passionate about doing. Um, we want you guys to make sure you do stay connected to us um, as we um, can as we want to continue to serve community in a way that makes the most sense and impacts you all the most. Thanks. Okay, uh, Kiara and I can field any questions if you have some, if you think we can answer them. Remember, I'm, I'm a mouse doctor, so um, clinical questions are kind of out of my realm of expertise. Signs of chemotherapy. Oh, you want me to? Yeah. Go ahead. Right. You can mute me. I have a question. You can't see me, but I'm down here. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm just. I'm wondering about the um, the downsides of, of immunotherapy, about how you prevent the drugs, or how they prevent the drugs from attacking healthy cells as well. Um, yeah. So the every therapy has a downside to it, and so for checkpoint blockade, for example, um, that's where the we remove the breaks that the tumor has put on the immune system. Well, those breaks are put on normal immune responses to wind them down and to deactivate them, right? So uh, you may, there may be some autoimmunity that would result if the breaks are released from cells that are autoreactive. Uh, that might be something that, that is a bit of a problem. Um, most of the time, though, we can, we can deal with those sorts of um, toxicities. A major toxicity that happens with CAR T cells results from killing of healthy cells. So I know I sold you on, or maybe I didn't sell you, but I tried to sell you on the fact that these are exquisitely specific and they are. But for CAR T cell therapy, what, um, what, we're, what we've chosen to target are molecules that are expressed on healthy B cells as well as um, healthy cells as well as, as well as malignant cells. And so then CAR T cells can only be used if, you, um, if you're targeting a non-essential tissue. Let me step back. I realized that that didn't even make sense to me. Uh, <laughs> so Emily, let's talk about Emily. Emily had a type of white blood cell cancer. Her B cells, one of her B cells became malignant and became a tumor. What her CAR T cells recognize is a molecule that's only expressed on B cells, malignant as well as healthy cells. So Emily is immunocompromised for life. She doesn't have healthy B cells making antibodies. She has to get antibodies that are pooled from thousands of donors injected intravenously a few times every year. This is a lousy side effect, but it's better than being dead, right? Which is what her other option was. So ideally what we'd like to do is to find something that is tumor specific, only expressed by the tumor, and not by any other, any other healthy cell, even a healthy cell from which the tumor is derived. Those things are hard to find. And there's a lot of effort to find them and we're starting to understand them. But what you see in the clinic 
is about 10 years behind what's happening in the lab because it has to go through all of these regulatory processes before it become, becomes clinically available. So at the time Emily received her CAR T cell therapy, that was the state of the art. And that's the best that we had. So Emily is immunocompromised for life. So there are downsides and it's, um, you know, maybe auto reactivity, maybe being immunocompromised. But again, these are patients that were, would have been, were otherwise terminally ill. So it's a compromise. I'd like to read a uh, uh, entry in the chat room, actually from a friend whose photos you see behind me. Uh, is there a role for immunotherapy for treatment of COVID-19? Oh yeah, I mean, that's what the vaccine is. So the vaccine is eliciting those antibodies in the absence of disease. So for an immune response, I can talk for hours on this stuff, so you've got to be careful here. Um, <laughs> for an immune response to occur, it needs really two things. One is a target for the immune system, and the second is an activation signal. So the immune system knows that this balance has been perturbed. What the vaccine does is it provides a target and an activation signal in the absence of the disease or the the deleterious effects of being infected with the virus. And so what it does is it activates the immune system. And so maybe one in a million B cells will make antibodies against the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. But if you vaccinate first, now you've expanded up that one cell. And so now instead of being at a frequency of one in a million, you've got a frequency of maybe one in a thousand or one in 10,000. So if you ever get infected with the virus itself, you've got these pre-activated high frequency cells that can make antibodies that will eradicate the virus before you even know you're infected. Or if you are get infected, your, <clears throat> your symptoms are gonna be much less severe because the um, immune system is that much further down the road, if you will. If you were not vaccinated and you got infected with the virus, it would take roughly a week or so for your immune system to start making enough molecules to eradicate the virus. Well, the virus replicates probably every 20 minutes. And so the, the immune system is fighting a huge uphill battle because by the time there's enough effector molecules and effector cells to get rid of the virus, the virus is already causing its problems. So what the immune system, what a vaccine does is it will prime your immune system and get your immune system ready so that when you are exposed to the virus, it's ready to go. You don't have to wait a week. You're, you're going from day one. The other thing you've probably heard about is this monoclonal antibody from Regeneron. That's a monoclonal antibody that binds the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus and inhibits its, its infection. And so this is called passive immunity, meaning you're getting an immune response, but it's given to you passively by taking this antibody and injecting it into you. So that's another type of immunotherapy for CAR for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. That's why you, you've probably read stories in the paper about anti-vaxxers who contract COVID and then want a vaccine when they're in the hospital thinking it's gonna be like a drug that'll cure, cure the virus. It's too late at that point because the virus is widespread. The vaccine is prophylactic, it prevents it. It's not therapeutic, it doesn't treat it. I have another question here from I think Jolene, has any of the research revealed possible approaches to prevention of cancer, say related to diet, exercise, and other life practices? Yeah, definitely. And Kiara um, alluded to what we call the cancer continuum. And this is looking at cancer from soup to nuts, if you will. So what causes cancer? If you understand what causes cancer and you can reduce your exposure to some carcinogen in the environment, you reduce the likelihood that you will get cancer. So there's what's called etiology, which is how a disease arises. Then there's prevention. So if you understand how the disease arises and you can prevent it, you're better off. And so the, that old phrase, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure is definitely appropriate for cancer. So um, lifestyle changes, don't smoke cigarettes. If you're fair skinned and you're out in the, or if you're out in the sun a lot, wear skin protection. You know, don't go to tanning salons. There are um, fruits and vegetables that are enriched with cancer fighting agents like antioxidants, blueberries, for example, and cruciferous vegetables like um, 
broccoli and, and Brussels sprouts. I hate Brussels sprouts, so I eat a lot of broccoli. So yeah, there are definite things uh, that you can you can incorporate into your diet and into your lifestyle. And related to that, Bill, there are, are three ways that you can get cancer, two of which you can do nothing about. One is bad luck. You can be born with a defective gene that predisposes you to cancer. Or you could be unintentionally exposed to uh, radiation or, or something like that. So just be un being unlucky. The second is old age, because cancer arises from the accumulation of mistakes. And these mistakes accumulate over time. So the older you are, the more likely it is that you will have accumulated enough mistakes in one of your cell that it will become malignant. And then the third is lifestyle, where you intentionally expose yourself to cancer-causing agents and the poster child is cigarette smoke. So the only one of those three you can control is your lifestyle. And then also um, healthy eating and exercise. And yeah, what a surprise, right? Um, constant inflammation is a source, can, can set you up for cancer. So obesity causes constant chronic low-level inflammation that can be a setup for cancer. People with inflammatory bowel disease that are higher risk for colorectal cancer because of low level chronic inflammation. On the subject of CAR T cells, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a very expensive uh, treatment and, that, and because it's individual specific, uh, is there hope for off the shelf approaches to CAR T cell therapy? Yeah, there are. Um, so our colleague here in the Cancer Center, Jeff Miller, is using a, another type of white blood cell called an NK or natural killer cell as a type of off-the-shelf reagent. Um, the problem with off-the-shelf reagents is that your body will potentially recognize them as being foreign, like a graft. If you get a tissue graft, you have to be immunocompromised. So um, what we're trying to do is to turn off the recognition units that your immune system would see to show the immune system that this is not you. So all of these things are being um, studied in the lab right now. But yeah, the, the goal would be to have some sort of off-the-shelf reagent. Because we can get all the That's fine. That's fine. Other questions? Yeah, these questions are spot on. This is what we're dealing with. I would just like to say to um, thank you, and especially when you talked about hitting your head against the wall for 20 years, but then you still hung in there. So I, I, uh, I personally really want to thank you for your patience and your dedication and uh, being able to uh, see that uh, the way to keep, keep moving forward. So thank, thank you, you all for the work that you do in this and uh, it makes a huge impact on so many people's lives. So thank you. You're welcome, Barbie. Thank you. Yeah, this is a great place to work. I meet people like Bill and Kiara and, you know, I feel like I'm getting paid to do my hobby. It's exciting. I, I like coming to work and engaging with the community is fantastic. As I've said a couple of times, like, you know, it's just me and my mice. So it's <laughs> nice, to see, nice to see people every now and then. <laughs> well, I'm and, sure we will invite you back and we'll okay. see what the, the latest research is. So thank I'd be you. happy to come back and hopefully it'll be in a post COVID era. Right. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you very much. This was a great session. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care.